What a time to be alive if you are a fan of the FA-18 Super Hornet. Meng's dropped one, Hobby Boss has dropped one, and they're both looking to take over from Hasegawa, who's been the king of the hill for a while now. Meng and Hobby Boss have both been trading punches with Meng announcing their FA-18E, followed by Hobby Boss, and then Meng offering up their F, followed by Hobby Boss, and now Hobby Boss finally getting first of the bell with the Growler, and Meng announcing theirs just yesterday. Why are manufacturers suddenly pumping out FA-18s as fast as they can? Pretty simple, really. It's the star of the new movie Top Gun 2, Maverick. You know, that movie that was supposed to release last year, and then later on it was delayed, and then delayed again, and it's still delayed? Yeah, that's the one. Where the Tomcat was the top aircraft for the Navy in the 80s, it's been long replaced by the Super Hornet. And let's not kid ourselves. The previews for Top Gun Maverick probably have the best air-to-air -air aviation scenes shot to date. Or at least a very close second to Dunkirk. One common area that's a challenge for any company that's designing a modern jet is trying to get the intakes to go together easily, make for easy cleanup, and get them into place afterwards. And Meng's approach is to put the seams in opposite corners. And this actually works well here because you really only have to clean up one seam nicely because you'll never see the opposite one once it's installed. So by installing a little bit of putty, a little bit of filing, you can have a nice seamless intake. Plus with a gear bay that mounts securely in place for alignment, gives Meng the win with the intakes so far. Another big point for Meng is the detail in the gear bay. I won't lie, I often cut corners here because you don't often see it. By painting this white and hitting it with a dark brown wash, it actually makes it look quite busy, and you really don't have to add anything else in there. That's a huge improvement over the F-35 I've built of theirs a couple years ago, which seriously lacked detail in that department. Another win for the Meng kit is you can paint the intakes before installing them. If you play your cards right, you paint the inlet and then the intake, and you don't have to mask anything as shown here. You get a nice clean join line. Unfortunately, that was one of the last things to be installed onto the body of the aircraft that went without any hitch. The second major challenge for any company that's designing a Hornet or a Super Hornet is how to get the leading edge extensions into place. Do they model it with the upper half of the aircraft? Do they model the nose separately like to me as Tomcat? Or do they just do it like a sandwich and have the bottom and tops come together? Meng has gone that route, and unfortunately, while there are some slight fit issues at the rear of the aircraft, it leaves quite the gap under the leading edge extensions that require quite a bit of sprue goo, goo to clean up. Sprue goo. Oh my god. I've also left this part of the video uncut just so you can see that it is quite an issue trying to get everything to close up together. Just like the Kinetic Hornet that I built two years ago that had this same issue. You'll notice the weird puzzle-like locking tabs by my fingertips and my thumb there. And that was actually causing quite a bit of an issue as well. And it turned out the easiest way to get those to lock into place was to actually push the bottom of the aircraft a little bit just to get it to splay outwards. And once those went into place, that part of the connection was pretty solid. So I decided to start from there and then work to the tail and the nose. But again, this is a little more complicated than it needs to be. The best part of all that is once you actually get it all together, there's still some gaps that need to be sorted from tiny gaps to these horrendous sized gaps at the leading edge. Had I known that another modeler I respect was gonna build the same kit about three weeks behind me, I would have waited. Because when Will Pattison was putting his together, he just checked the note button right away and went straight to the Bessie clamps to get this thing to sit together. So, in hindsight, I need some Bessie clamps. It's not all doom and gloom though, because once you've make it past this step, the leading edge of the wings, the flaps, all go together quite well and without any real difficulty. Same with the vertical stabilizers, they just drop into place. So for every couple minutes you seem to be fighting with the kit, there's a couple minutes where it's working with you. However, you are not going to be out of the woods yet. The best is yet to come. The only real positive I can say about all this is that that gap is on the bottom side of the aircraft, and unless you plan on mounting this inverted, any work you do there is going to be invisible anyways. While I do enjoy the detail that Meng's included in their cockpit, around the MFDs you have lots of switches that dry brushing will bring out, the decals don't fit properly. They're meant to be applied as a whole unit, and I did that just to see how they fit, and they don't. So I ended up cutting them out individually, and the problem is that it just looked too cartoonish, so I ended up going with a shut down stage of the cockpit. Getting the nose to seat in place in this model was probably the biggest challenge. 
For the Tamiya Tomcat would slide right in place with no issues, this one was nothing but issues. When I could finally get the front lined up, the rear of the nose didn't want to seat flush against the leading edges, and I ended up deleting the locating tabs just to get it to sit properly. As you can see here, there was a gap that I just could not get rid of. It did not want to sit in place. And in hindsight, I would have liked to glue some styrene behind the nose just to keep it from bending inwards as it was being handled because that seam popped off twice and it was really hard to clean it all up afterwards. By using pins on the pylons, Meng gives you the option of switching out the ordnance on the model. And now back to more cleanup on the nose with sprue goo and this took a few nights and it sucked the fun right out of this kit. After a few nights and rounds of filling and sanding, I was finally ready to move on from the seams. As far as injection molding has come with scale models, there's still always going to be an issue with the canopy, and that's just because of the shape of it because it's blown out. You'll have a seam on the top, and my process for getting rid of that is to start out with a brand new blade on my knife, and I'll lightly scrape that seam away until it's flush with the plastic. Then I'll start sanding with sanding sticks. I ordered these from an online store and they're infinity sanding sticks and they are awesome. And by working my way up through every single one of the grits, I was able to sand out the seam. Right now it looks like the canopy's fogged, but that's actually micro scratches on the surface. And once I'm at that level, I move into the Tamiya polishing compounds going from coarse, fine to finishing. For the last round of polishing, I use a microfiber cloth, and that's just to really work in the polish and clean up the canopy. This is a process that can take some time. I know Kinetic has tried to get around this seam in their tracker and their prowler by using separate canopy pieces, but that just seems like it's asking for trouble. To prime this model, I'm using Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black, and the nice thing about black is it'll let you see any imperfections in the bodywork before moving into paint. And you'll also notice I'm putting quite a wet coat down in the angle here where the leading edge extension joins the nose. And the reason for that is jets are very prone to dusting. So I'm using wet coats just to try to avoid some of it. Just like the Corsair before it, I'm using sandwich shading on this model. I'm starting with light ghost gray, which will be the final blend coat, but I'm just coming in with a splotchy first coat. And I want to leave some of the black shining through. And the idea here is that it's going to add some depth to the paint. Once that layers down, I come in with some Kark Tan just to warm it up a little bit. From that, I moved on to Medium Sea Gray. And to also screw with the final color, I used some Insignia White. I then blended everything in with a very thin down coat of Light Ghost Gray. And I want all that wear and tear to show through the paint, and this is to give it some depth. Hornets are some of the filthiest aircraft I've ever seen in my life, especially when they're flying on board ship. So this is the first weathering stage as well. I'm also going to look to enhance all of that later with oils. Now on the top of the aircraft, I'm going to repeat that same process, but start with Dark Ghost Grey from AK Real Colors. I also wanted to take a moment to thank the Plastic Posse podcast for inviting me on their show. You guys put together a fantastic podcast, and it was a, such a pleasure to have been invited and meeting you all personally. I really enjoyed it. I had fun, and I really hope that everybody who listened to the podcast had as much fun as we did. And if you're not listening to the Plastic Posse podcast, you're missing out. They make for a great time, especially when you're sitting at the bench building. To add even more filth to the top of the Hornet, I'm coming in with Aggressor Gray as an additional blend layer, just to really make the, oh my god, that's filthy. <laughs> I know this looks crazy right now, but you have to trust the process. As I come in with the blend coat, as I come in with oils, as I come in with the panel liners, it's going to push this all back quite a bit. So as drastic as it looks, it will start to fade away. And this isn't even the best part yet. It's very hard to see unless it's in a very contrasted photo, but the Super Hornet does have two different color grays to it, and the demarcation line is very soft. So I simply cut a piece of cardboard and use it as a template to make sure both sides matched. Now it's time to come in with the blend coat and start pushing back that sandwich shading. And by taking my time here and leaving this uncut, you can see how slow and how much control you have over this process. The great thing as well is it's very dynamic, so after you have your blend coat down, 
You can come in again with some darker or lighter shades and keep changing things up until you're happy. One nice thing about building a modern aircraft model is there are lots of references for you to check out. After using Mr. Mark softener and setting solutions on these decals, they still needed two clear coats on top and to have the carrier film sanded down. They were a tad thick. But the nice thing about sanding decals is you can also weather them that way. As much as I liked the Jolly Rogers scheme, it seemed like everybody and their dog's been doing those lately. And for some reason, the line jet all gray really appealed to me. That just meant that making the model interesting was going to be more of a challenge. Now back to more weathering. The pizza box on the nose, in the, one of the reference photos I had, had some chipping on it and let you see the zinc chromate underneath. So using some lacquer paints, chipping fluid, and then acrylic paints, I was able to mimic that. I also wanted to take a moment to thank two people who had sent me photos right from the flight decks of Hornets in action to really let me see how dirty these things get and how grimy and beat up they are, and all the corrosion control that gets painted on. Your guys' help was instrumental in this and I can't thank you enough. So I hope you accept this as kind of a tribute to your job and what you do to keep these aircraft flying. Some of the areas that also showed some chipping down to the zinc chromate was the pylons for all the weapons and the drop tanks. My goal is to have all these little things add together to the bigger picture. Once all the chipping was done, I then mixed some light ghost gray with a 50% insignia white, thinned it down, and then started painting on some corrosion con control. And that's what really makes naval aircraft stand out to me. You'll see this patchwork on them, and it just makes them so interesting. To do this, I'm shooting it at about 10 PSI through my Pro Convoy 270. For the pin wash on this aircraft, I've mixed both Absalom's Starship filth with some neutral gray and just darkened it up until it was a few shades darker than the paint. Then I thinned it down with some odorless thinner until it would run freely in the mixing cup. Then I placed it on the model and let it dry for about 20 to 30 minutes. Then I came in with a lint-free cloth and wiped it away. Areas around access panels or hatches that would have a lot of traffic, I used just straight Starship filth for a panel liner, just to show the difference in wear and tear. Now that the pin wash is done, it's kind of set out a blueprint for where I can come in with some oil paint rendering and really start adding some more filth onto the aircraft. Anywhere around access panels or where crew's hands or boots are going to be, I came in with some grays, browns, beiges, and just put down thin layers and then blended them in until I was happy. To add more of a random effect, I'm using a Deerfoot stippler just to blend this in. I also have to take a moment to thank Mike Rinaldi who's doing live stream videos and really focusing on oil work and this was something that this model really had a lot of more so than the Corsair and that was because I really wanted this paint to dance so by using different grays, browns and lights, different brushes, different thinness of the paint, it really added up and gave this aircraft the character I wanted. It's just one of those things that with more practice, more applications, I'm definitely starting to get more comfortable with it. Whereas a year ago, I would have been very hesitant to touch oils. I'm definitely a lot more aggressive with them now and having fun with the process, really. That's what this whole hobby comes down to is just have fun with it. Another weird thing about this kit is that the inside of the burner cans have some pretty good detail for out of the box but the outside of them are really lacking, so I'm not sure what happened there, or maybe Meng just expects you to buy some aftermarket stuff. But there's enough detail there that if you hit it with a pin wash and some oils, you can really make it pop. To simulate the wear and tear inside of a Hornet, I used some buff and some Tamiya dark yellow just to break things up inside and try to get as close as I could to the real thing. My go-to color for doing burner cans in 148 scale is Mr. Color's Iron, and the reason for that is you can just scratch up the edges a little bit and get some shine to them to simulate what the wear on a can looks like. To help clean up the gaps in the laser-guided munitions to this kit, I decided to use the casting texture again, and it's not too bad on modern aircraft, so I ended up sanding it down a little bit afterwards. And then I found some references to paint because the Air Force, and the Navy all use different colors on their bombs. I would definitely recommend picking up some aftermarket resin items for this instead of using the kit stuff. To summarize Meng's FA-18 Super Hornet kit, I'm going to use the words of Comrade Diet Love. 
It's not great, and it's not terrible. I would definitely build this over the Hasegawa Super Hornet, and Hobby Boss, I haven't built theirs yet, so if you work for Hobby Boss, definitely hit me up and I'll give it a fair review. That's going to conclude this build. I hope you've enjoyed it, and as always, click like, hit subscribe, and please feel free to leave your comments, criticism, in the comment section below. And if you're able to, you can also follow and support me on Patreon. I have three tiers you can join at, with the top tier having one week early access to videos, second tier 24-hour ad-free, and everybody can see high-def photos as they're uploaded. I can't say thank you enough to the people who are supporting me on Patreon, because that really means a lot. With 2021 coming to a close, I hope I have enough time left to get one more project out before we start the new year. And thanks to the guys over at the Plastic Posse, the new year is going to start with something with tracks. So check those guys out. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.